This week's video is gonna be kind of awesome. And I've been asked quite a few times about LGBTQIA plus weddings um, and have been hesitant to make the video because I'm not the expert on it and I would never ever want to pose to be. So that's why in this week's video, I invited my sweet friend Sabrina from the Gay Agenda Collective to come on and talk through what some of these logistics look like in planning an LGBTQIA plus event. From wedding planning to consulting, Sabrina and her staff do an incredible job of creating a loving and wonderful space in this industry. So if you have continued questions moving forward, I cannot recommend the Gay Agenda Collective enough. I'm gonna leave all of her contact information down below because she and her staff are the experts on this. And so she deserves to have the spotlight in this moment, which brings me to a teeny tiny little request I have for you. She doesn't know I'm doing this. She started a YouTube channel. I'm gonna link it right here. Can y'all just jump over there and subscribe? Can we just surprise the heck out of her by like just subscribing? She currently has a few videos up. It's a week in the life of a wedding planner and she lives in Hawaii. Like I'm not jealous at all, but I am a little bit. And I know this is a place where she wants to continue to share behind the scenes of vlogs, of weddings, and also create a space for wedding content for the LGBTQIA plus community. So if that's you, you want to find out more information and you want to get continued support and or just support another awesome wedding planner creator, jump on over there, give her a follow. I cannot wait to just like shock her with the amount of people that are going to jump on over there and start following her. <laughs> no pressure, Sabrina. <laughs> I love you. Don't hate me. Okay. So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. Sabrina, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm so excited. Of course. I'm so happy to be here. I, I, I mean, we've had how many interactions now? I think you've been on the podcast twice. Yeah. Twice. Yes. Twice. <laughs> like how many times? <laughs> one, one, two. Um, so Sabrina has been a, uh, a longtime friend of ours over at the union podcast, which is a, a wedding industry focused podcast where uh, Heather and I, my business partner, we share a lot of insight into, um, how to run a wedding business. Cause that's, that's hard in and of itself, but there are so many experiences that we don't have any idea about. And honestly, Sabrina, that's, as you know, that's why you're here today, because this is your wheelhouse. This is where you thrive. This is, this is. I am a queer indigenous wedding planner in Hawaii. And yeah, this is pretty much my passion is to, you know, support couples who are queer and support, you know, wedding professionals who are trying to be more inclusive and delve into what it means to be an ally in this community. So yeah, very big for me. It is something I'm very passionate about and I'm so excited to be talking about it today. I know. And I didn't want to feign to know everything about this. And so I thought let's, it was important to me to create this space for someone who knows so much more about this. And we haven't even said the name of your business. <laughs> yeah, we did it. <laughs> well, my business is the Gay Agenda Collective. Yeah. The Gay, and the we, gay Agenda Collective. Doing, the Gay Agenda Collective. We've been doing this for four years now. So fairly new. I think once you hit the five year, that's when you get your new medal or something in the wedding industry. I'm mm -hmm. unsure. You also learned the secret handshake. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's, I'm excited for that. Uh, and you get a, a discount at Denny's too, which is kind of cool. Oh, great. But it's only between the hours of 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. on a Saturday. So I usually can. <laughs> on the way home, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so today we want to talk about what the logistics look like of planning an LGBTQIA plus event. So, because there are so many considerations and so many factors, we really want to walk you through some of the logistics and some of the potential opportunities and how can you can really create a day that suits you and your partner, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that weddings in general are like snowflakes. Every wedding will look different <laughs> and be very reflective of you as the people who are getting married. And I think what's so beautiful about how we are headed as an industry is that we are giving couples so much more autonomy to make their own choices for their wedding day. And so when it comes to working through LGBTQIA plus weddings, you know, we want you folks to have the most autonomy through this entire process. Yeah. We had kind of talked through a little bit beforehand. What are some of the touch points that um, a couple like this would, would potentially experience? And then what are some of the options in front of them? And it, I think the first thing that we had talked about was your support system. Oh yeah. Yeah. That is pretty much the foundational point for anybody who is planning a wedding, but specifically for queer folk, I would say that having a solid support system is really going to set you up for success. Backstory of myself. Um, I joke, but I am so serious when I say that our wedding party uh, for my wife and I literally carried us to the to the altar because we had, you know, 
not had family participation really in our wedding day. And that was, you know, one area that was very sensitive for us, but we also just had felt kind of disincluded with the, with the industry at the time we got married in 2019, which doesn't seem very long ago, but it was at the time where, you know, people weren't really implementing a lot of practices into their, their businesses. And that was okay at the time, but you know, we just didn't feel very included. We didn't know where we stood within our families, within ourselves. And so our wedding party was literally there to kind of support us. And so one of the ways that we figured out who we wanted to include in our wedding party was write down everything, write down every person that was in our nuclear family. So the people who were like our siblings, I'm an only child, so I had no, I had a very short family tree. <laughs> my, like my, my partner had, you know, her sibling and, and like our family and kind of working up from there with cousins. And then we, you know, delved into who our chosen family was, like mm-hmm. who are the people who were supporting us that weren't in our biological family, but were still considered family to us. And then based off of those two family trees, we kind of figured out who we wanted to support us on our wedding day and then from there we went into like how have they supported us not just as individuals but also as a couple because we wanted to make sure that the people who surrounded us were people who who really valued not just us as individuals but us as a couple and I think taking that time to really work through those details allowed us to make very solid decisions on who was there with us and I have no regrets. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have no regrets. And I'm still as close as ever with the people in our wedding party as we were on the day of our wedding. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's just a healthy practice in general to really kind of pull back those layers and have those conversations. Now you've actually turned this into a, a, a di- like a download. So the audience can do that as well. Yes. Yes. You can download that. And I think it's very, it's an intentional practice to do. Um, but it's also something that's very necessary because it gets you talking to about, you know, the different roles that people have played. So yeah, it is a digital download. It's something I think everybody should take advantage of. (laughs) So I've gone ahead and linked it. I don't know how zoom is going to, it's, it's in the upper corner. You'll see it. It's popping up right now. There it is. So if you want to download that, um, it'll give you the opportunity for you and your partner to kind of work through some of those things, because uh, as many of you know, this is a very emotional process. So choosing the right teammates to go through the next three, six, 15, 24 months um, is yeah. going to be really pivotal. Yeah. And I think we'll touch more in depth of it a little bit later, but why that's so important is that you're able to utilize these people through this process of planning a wedding, right? Like they're not just there to stand in pretty wedding attire and give a funny speech and drink you under the table on your wedding day. (laughs) They're also there to kind of do some of the hard stuff that maybe you don't have. uh, If you don't have family participation on your wedding day, you're able to kind of pass that along to those people in in support for you all. So that I I think is why it's so important to be very intentional with the choices you make for for the people who will stand next to you on the wedding day. And, And it's also important to be intentional with your vendor selection this is huge. This is another one of those main before you even get started planning or as you are getting started being intentional with a selection of your vendors. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I say that when you are interviewing your vendors, it is important that you ask the necessary questions. You can go on Pinterest or any website and it'll give you a series of questions to ask that ask logistical questions. Those are very important. You wanna make sure that someone, are you timely? Do you, are you gonna play the cha-cha slide or are you, are you not? <laughs> like there are questions that you, that are good from a business standpoint to know for the wedding day on a logistic side, but there are also hyper, um, emotional and sensitive questions that you want to also ask. So like asking the questions of how do you typically pose me? Like, how are you going to pose yes. me? like for your photo and video? That's a huge one, right? <laughs> yes. Because, and this is actually an, another interview we had on the, on the union podcast where someone had mentioned that, um, their partner and them, they, they were put in awkward or uncomfortable positions that just didn't feel natural to them. So uh, one thing that I thought was a good reflection after that is just asking the question, how do you show affection? 
Like, how do yeah. you show affection as a couple? Um, like my husband, for instance, does not, you know? So <laughs> it, it was one of those that it was a hard, a hard point for him on our wedding day, but having mm-hmm. a vendor ask you those questions. So if they're not asking that question, what does a couple do? Yeah, I think it's being very clear. You know, I, I I have this, I'm stuck in sometimes this dichotomy of, of couples having to come out to their vendors. And unless you have, um, you know, somebody who can do that on your behalf, unfortunately, where we are in this industry right now, if you, you know, if you do choose a vendor who maybe does not specialize in queer events, or it's not really seen in their business practices, you know, not all vendors have like allyship built into their practices right so like let's just say you find a photographer that you're like I they're it's dreamy the way that they take photos it's like butter it's everything I envisioned but they don't really have a lot of queer representation so I'm unsure if that's Mm -hmm. something that they're aware of it is labor intensive and it is unfortunate with where we're at but if that is something that is more important that you really want this vendor then it is does kind of lend to the couple to then have to kind of go out there and and say hey just so you know we are a queer couple and here are some areas that we want to touch on to make sure that we're as comfortable as we can be on our wedding day and we really want to work with you because your style is everything that we dreamt of but we want to make sure that you understand where we're coming from. We aren't people who like a lot of PDA. We like more candid shots. We um, aren't during family photos. We might not have a huge family that are going to be there for the family photos. And we want to make you aware of that now. So as we get closer to the wedding day, you're not asking us, you know, is dad or mom going to be in the photos? We want to make sure that you're aware of it from the beginning, that this is where we're at. And, you know, most vendors will be understanding of that. I think in the vendor sourcing process, being very clear in your communication and making sure that, you you know, you're kind of articulating all the things that are important to you Mm -hmm. kind of helps with that process. But it is kind of twofold. It's having the really good communication, but also asking the right questions Um, that that's kind of where you can kind of set yourself up for success if for whatever reason, the vendor is not asking these clarifying questions on their end. Um, That's, I guess, what I did through the process. It was unfortunate because, you know, it did feel like at some times I was coming out to my vendors a lot of the way. I was like, hey, I'm gay. Like, do you work with me? And, you know, fortunately, majority of them were like, yeah, we're good. (laughs) And a lot of them felt like, oh, that's a weird question to ask. But there were some vendors along the way who were like, oh, no, I'm sorry. Like we, we don't. And I was like, Oh, okay. Glad I know now. And I will, you know, it's uncomfortable for me and it's an extreme bummer, but I'm so glad I told you right now that I am queer because had you had shown up on the day and you've been like, actually, I don't mess with this and left me and without a vendor to fill that position way worse. So I'm, you know, grateful that I, I was very upfront from the beginning and was able to communicate those those little areas where I, I wanted our vendors to know. Yeah. And I think that's, there's also uh, the complete freedom to, if you find available in your area, right. Cause there are definitely going to be some people um, in different locations. They're like, this is not available to me. Right. Like, this is mm. just not something that we have in this area. It could be a, a small town in the middle of nowhere and it's just not as possible. So I just want to recognize that it, it may not be as simple as what I'm about to say, but if you do find yourself in a place where um, uh, the emotional labor uh, on top, well, first of all, planning wedding, emotional, right? <laughs> but yeah. the emotional labor of really working through all that with all of your vendors, um, if that means that you specifically only work with those that are, you can tell and you can look at their feed or you can look at the, any a bit of their website and you can tell with complete assurity that they, that they are LGBTQIA plus affirming, and they're there for it. And they do a lot of events like that. Mm -hmm. Go fully that direction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, And so I, I think that you kind of touched on a great point that, yeah, not every area, not every city is going to have that um, inclusion, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, when, when we're thinking like LA, New York, these larger metropolitan cities, the, there is a vast amount of of queer affirming and queer owned businesses that are very hyper aware of this, but for majority of the country, 
a lot of these smaller areas don't have the resources or um, don't have the vendors who, who cater to, to queer couples. And it's unfortunate, but it is the reality. And so mm -hmm. that's where it kind of comes into for, for you folks advocating for yourself or you know coming back to the support system, having your support system advocate mm -hmm. for you and, and, and really do that laborious work if that is something that just feels too emotionally charged for you to take care of on your own, that's okay because I get it. I get that as it gets, especially as it gets closer to the wedding day, these conversations are so touchy and it's like, I, I don't want to talk to anybody anymore mm -hmm. who doesn't get it. That's where that support system comes back into play to be able to like have those conversations on your behalf. And the main focus for vendors, I think where we're going to see greater touch points with this or the main folk vendors to be focusing on would be photography, videography, mm -hmm. DJ, um, and coordinator. Also probably inefficient. Anyone who's, uh, using a microphone or capturing <laughs> your love on a camera of some sort, or mm -hmm. someone like a wedding planner or coordinator, who's going to be lovingly in your face, right. Throughout planning mm -hmm. and on your wedding day, those are the, the five, the five key ones. Now that's not to say that you're, um, at least from the feedback that I'm hearing that those would be the most important ones. And that's not to say yeah. that you know, obviously you want a baker that'll work with you. You want a caterer that will work with you. You want a, a bartending mm -hmm. company that'll work with you. But if they have the microphone or if they're going to be very close to your face on your wedding day, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to have a lot higher of an impact. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I mean, kind of going through each one, I would say, you know, for photo and video, you know, going through those questions of of posing, going through the questions or the information of who's going to be in those photos post ceremony, um, you know, going through um, the like the what how you folks want to be posed on the day. That's really important. So those are like areas that you can talk through. Same for the DJ and the officiant, right? Like they're the ones who are speaking on your behalf right mm -hmm. like they're they're kind of DJs are hyping up the crowd and sometimes I know with a lot of DJs there's this innate want to be funny and so like if even like for those areas like maybe there's some areas like it's not really funny or you don't want jokes on or like you want it mm -hmm. to have moments of seriousness or um, you know, you want to be pronounced a certain way. Those are things that you want to, you want to kind of work through your vendors and make sure that if they're not asking those questions, that you are telling them exactly what you want. And if from there, they don't take heed to that, then that's another layer that you can kind of work through. But as long as you're being very clear of what you want through this process, there should be no hiccups along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Should be is key. Should be. Yeah, should um, is the operative word there. Now let's talk about attire shopping, like yeah. shopping for clothing for your wedding day, because of course there's the heteronormative of a gown and a suit. And also um, I feel like this applies to just budget couples in general, because there is this assumption that it's going to be a brand new, super expensive dress and a very, very nice suit. Right. Um, yeah. So what, what could that process look like? Yeah. So I think it goes back to, again, like with your support system. So if you are going to, if you do choose to go the dress route or even the suit route, any type of fitting, right? So say you're going to go and try on this wedding attire. I think it's good to call ahead um, and just kind of preface and set the tone. That's really important. Um, usually I always advise my couples to have somebody do that on their behalf, whether that's through us as the coordination company or, um, you know, having a really good family friend or somebody that is your, your best person to do that for you, but setting the tone of like, Hey, just so you know, we made an appointment and I want to just give you some information about who will be in attendance. We have these people, there will be no mother or there will be no father, or there will be no blood relatives who will be in attendance. It's a sensitive place for the person who is trying on the attire. We also want to let you know that this is a queer wedding, which means that one of the partners will be in this attire and another partner will be in this attire. So we just want to make that a known to you folks so that there are no hiccups when we attend, because that is like the worst thing is when you go to shop for your attire and you're, let's just say for me, like, right, I was a lesbian, I'm a lesbian. And when we went dress shopping, they were like, oh, and what's your, like, they really thought my wife and I were two just best gal pals 
shopping for a dress together <laughs> for our double wedding. Like when we said it, when we said that we were getting married, they're like, oh my God, you, you both are getting married on the same day. And I was like, yes, to oh each other. <laughs> and it was so uncomfortable because it, it just like, it made everyone, everyone who was there uncomfortable. And from that point forward, I was like, no, we are going to be oh. very specific and very clear on what is going to happen at this event? Like what's going to happen at this try on? So that would be step one, I would say in, the, in that process. And then, you know, step two, I always say like what you wear on your wedding day should be something that is reflective of you. If you are not somebody who loves wearing a dress, but tradition says, because you are maybe more cis presenting or more feminine that you have to be in a dress, but that just doesn't feel right for you, then don't do it. Wear what feels right to you where what is going to make you feel the most comfortable and also what's going to be the most comfortable on your body because the last thing you want is to wear something that is uncomfortable and literally have to be sewn out of your dress or like pulled out of your dress I I know this from experience what? so do as I say not as I do <laughs> um because I literally my like my wife pulled her shoulder in her dress I was like I felt like one of those Pillsbury dough things just ready to explode right out if you twisted me in the wrong way. <laughs> but I think it's, it's knowing yourself. And it, again, it's just going to keep coming back to the same thing in the, in the preliminary stages, which is really just advocating for yourself or, or having somebody who can advocate for you on what, what it is that you want. Um, I'm plus size. So that was also something else that I brought up too with in my try-ons, which I was like, please do not bring me any size twos and make me feel bad about my body. Mm. But I do not want that. Mm. <laughs> and, and that is something that I do a lot for like my couples who do not fit into the standard model two, four dress size, sample size, right? That's, that's something that we do. So um, that is important. And then, you know, with, with the attire too, I think it's just I think I said this already, but yeah, just coming back to the idea of wearing what feels the most inclusive of who you are on yes. your wedding day. That's I also huge. think a tailor is going to be your best friend. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Thank you for saying this. Yes. A tailor is huge. And I know that you folks have a lot of partnerships with, uh, I, I believe you have a partnership with a suit company, right? Yes. Yeah. We've been a, shameless we've been... plugging. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I absolutely love generation talks. And that's actually something that a conversation that we had with them when we did an interview at wedding MBA in Vegas. And they're like, Hey, if, if there is someone who's more feminine presenting and they want to wear a suit, we can make it work. Like yeah. we could absolutely make it work. I think that that's, that's, and again, this is, comes back to representation within this industry. And this does not fall on you as the couple. This falls on us as vendors to do better. But for you in the current state of where you're at right now, right? If you're planning a wedding right now, I think it's very, um, it's good to know going into this that most locations will not have things that are exactly the way that you want it to look. So having a tailor is great, especially if you are, um, female presenting who wants to wear a suit who these suits were made for males and it's going to look really baggy Taylor is going to be your best friend yeah you're absolutely right <laughs> yeah and I actually had a um, a client who uh, as a trans person they were fortunate enough to find a tailor that sp that specifically specialized in doing suits for trans people so uh, that is another touch point. That is another another potential vendor that you're going to have to have a conversation with, or someone maybe go before you and have that conversation. But tailor, 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 whatever your body shape, whatever you're putting on your body, like you will look and feel like a million bucks if you can incorporate a tailor into that in one in one form or another. Now that does mm -hmm. remove the option of rentals, um, which would then you know if you're choosing to wear a suit, that's going to be uh, more costly. Although, gosh, what is, is it the suit the suit shop? There's a, a suit company that sells them for less than 200 bucks, right? I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. try to link them if I can, because um, that could be an awesome resource. Yeah, and, and I think customs, I mean, I, I know it's with rentals, and it's not to say that we want like queer people to have to pay more, but sometimes, honestly, having a custom, something made for you for your wedding day mm -hmm. is like the, the most... And most amazing thing we we have we did an interview one time with the house of Brenton. They used to be called Cur Custom Curvy Bride, but now I think they're called the House of Brenton. But they are a um, 
inclusive, inclusive fashion designer who makes wedding dresses, suits, and separates for trans and non-binary queer and allied folks. So like they, they, that's what they specialize in, and oh. it is so like cool to see their things too. Because I I send their Instagram a lot of the times to my couples because I'm like use their you know their pieces as reference too. You know to see what you like, and also reach out to reach out to them because they're amazing but <laughs> um I, I like I like their pieces because it's it's cool to see that representation to see mm-hmm. what what things you might like and that's where like that that dreaming up stage is really important too is like kind of going into this process with an idea of, of what you would like kind of helps so that you're not looking at things that do not feel like you at all (laughs) on the wedding day. Yeah. Oh, I love that resource. Whatever I can with these, I'm either going to link it up in the corner or we're going to drop it in the description box because got it. yeah, that's going to be, I I didn't even know that existed. That is, that's incredible. What a wonderful resource. Amazing. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Their stuff is amazing too. I I like, I look at it a lot of the times because they're size inclusive too. Um, that's like huge, huge for me. I think during, we had like a, a interview with them one time and we talked a lot of, again, about my dress faux pas, which was that I was literally uncomfortable in my dress the whole time. And looking back on it, I do feel like I looked great, but I didn't feel like that again, this, this process was so sensitive for me because I, mm. you know, I went alone outside of just myself and my partner. I didn't really have anybody else who was with me on the day of no no parent participation, no, nobody helping me pay for it. So that also helped like, or kind of altered how much money we were able to spend on, on our attire. So there were all these moments of feeling just like super emotional. And had I just had either one, an inclusive person who specialized this, had I had advocated for myself, had I had had somebody else advocate for me, I probably would have had a better experience through this process so that was that's the I'm very passionate about attire (laughs) yeah I mean and as as one should be because this is such a this is such an amazing and important day it uh, it's not the best day of your life you're gonna have a lot of best days but Mm -hmm. you put a lot of time a lot of effort and probably a ton of emotional labor into this you're gonna want to look like you feel good so I I and I think the process to getting there especially because you know uh, clothing journey is, um, can be a really emotionally fraught one anyways. So, but to add in all the extra stuff on top of it, that's, that's a lot. So we will definitely link that resource down below. Now, the most frequently asked is Mm -hmm. what does a timeline look like for a queer couple? And Mm -hmm. for me, I'm like, well, you just tell me what you want to do and we'll make it happen. But I I realized that that probably doesn't help people when they're like, yes, but I need to know my options. So kind of walking through the day of timeline from like getting ready to end of the night. What are some of the touch points um, and some of the options that should be considered uh, like starting with getting ready? Yeah. So getting ready. I, I, and I, you just, you basically just said what I'm thinking, which is like, I'm always like, whatever you want. And the <laughs> couple's always like, no, like I'm hiring you to tell me what do I want? I don't even know. And I know that that resonates with a lot of people because you, you, this is your first time planning this. And most of the time, this is your first go at it. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that the day is reflective of who you are, but we also want to give you some context so that you have some options, right? So with the getting ready process, I've seen for our couples, a plethora of what people have done. They've, you know, done the more traditional route where they get ready separately and um, they either have the, the big reveal during the ceremony or they have it during a first look. I'm always pro first look because especially if you're somebody who likes a lot of photos, have the first look tangent there but (laughs) um we've also seen our couples and this is something that I did during our wedding which is that they'll get ready together and one of the things that we incorporated within our event was we got ready together we wanted to spend as much of our day with each other as possible because you know we've been to a lot of weddings we've been in weddings where you know, the couple gets ready separately and then they literally have only seen each other on their wedding day, like six hours <laughs> from the start of the ceremony to the end. And even within that six hours, it's just go, 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 go. So we wanted to have that calm and that peace, especially since we didn't have our um, biological family that was included on the day of, we wanted 
to just have moments for ourselves to really sit in the beauty, but sit in also the pain together. And so we did that. And then what we ended up doing was we did a first look with our wedding party. I had never seen anybody do that before prior to our event. And it was really special. And again, we talked about our, our wedding party. They were amazing. So of course they cried the whole time for us, which was like so good. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what we did. And it just felt so much more special to us. And we've seen people do kind of a series of those variations within it, but that's kind of what I would say when you're deciding on what to do, it's deciding, do you want to have the grand reveal during the ceremony? Do you want to do a first look? Do you want to spend as much time together? Really asking these questions with one another to see what fits best for the things that you want on your wedding day. So like, do I, do we actually want to see each other or do we want to get ready together? Or do we want to, um, I guess those are the only two options, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to see each other or do you not? So I, I think that that's, that's good to, to know. But most of the times when, when people kind of sit in that and they, they realize like, oh my God, yeah, we, we, we don't really get to spend a lot of time together. Most times people are like, actually, we, we prefer to, to get ready together and do a reveal in another way and have this moment, this special moment in another way. And so that, that's kind of, from the getting ready process, that's one option. Um, and then kind of going into the next portion of it, you have your, your ceremony, right? That's, that's the next big timeline moment there. So the most frequently asked question is how do we get down the aisle? And again, I want to be like, however you want, I'll support you, but, but, but they haven't seen options of this, or they don't know what that looks like. So what are some of those options? So one of like the most innovative options or ways that we've seen people come down the aisle is doing what's called a double aisle. Those are so sick. And if your venue (laughs) has a natural ability to do it, it's like amazing. We did a wedding at Waddle's mansion in LA and they had these two grand staircases that meet stop it in the middle with where the ceremony was. And I was like, duh of course that's what we're gonna do we're gonna totally have you folks both come down either way and then it makes this like grand special moment for both of you where you're not feeling like you know one has a bigger reveal than the other it's super awesome we actually have a wedding in two weeks where they're doing the same thing we have a double aisle where they're gonna be in the middle and it's amazing um so that that's like one option you could do and we've seen a lot of people do and it's not weird at all like it's actually something that a lot of people even straight folks take advantage of because like I have a lot of grooms who are like hey I want to be special like gone are the days where the guy just enters in from the side because that's like like very old school traditional to have the groom's party walk in from from the side and then just the bridesmaids walk down so a lot of even non-queer people are, are taking advantage of that double aisle option um and then you know for us I'm, and I'm going to relate a lot of this back to myself, just because that is where a lot of my reasoning behind starting the business, behind being super passionate about this, it, it comes from a lot of this personal experience. So for us, you know, we, again, did not have our, our fathers walk us down the aisle. My dad did not want to, and my um, father-in-law had passed. So two very um real experiences that I think people face during the planning process. They either don't have that family participation or their, their person has gone on to the next life. Right. So you, you have these, these two, these two ideas. And so for us, you know, I, what I did was I sat with my wife and I said, okay, well, let's talk through this. Like, how do you feel if you walk first? And she was like, well, whatever, I don't really care. And I was like, okay, well, that doesn't really help me. <laughs> and that's probably the conversation that you m- majority of the people will have. Um, but for me, I was like, no, but I want you to have that special moment. Like my dad chose not to be here. Your dad, I think if he was here, would would want to do this. And I want you to feel special and feel loved on, on your wedding day. And so we made the decision where I was like, and it's not to say that the person walking down first is not as important as the person who's walking down secondary or like, or at last, it's just something that I chose for myself where I was like, I want to look at you as you walk down, because I want to see you and show you that we love you and we support you and we are here for you. Because I knew that that was what she needed in that season of her, of her life. 
she needed to know that she was loved and that she was supported. And I wanted all of us as her wedding party and as myself and as our um, officiant to stand there and just like welcome her into this experience of love. And so what we did was we draped down, um, it's called a tapa, which is in, um, for our culture, it is this cloth that is handmade and passed down generations and it was her father's. And so that was a piece of him that my wedding party laid out. It was like, a so only she walked across it. So right before she walked down, our best people rolled out this tapa for her and that's what she walked across. And then um, after we were pronounced, only her and I walked across this tapa and then our wedding party rolled it up. So it was just us two, her entering with her dad, us exiting with that, that um, like our ancestors walking us through. So that was what we did to make it very special. I literally <laughs> have the chills. That is a man. What a beautiful way of like incorporating culture, incorporating her father, like incorporating all of these details. And then it's just her. And then you become wed. And then the, just the two of you like that is and yeah. what a great opportunity to infuse your story in a unique mm -hmm. way. Um, yes. And still, I mean, kind of still falling into some of the more traditional walking down one at a time down the aisle kind of a thing, but making it yours. Yeah. Making yeah. it ours. And and I think that that's what's important. And, and so all these pieces of the timeline, and we'll go through each one, it's, it's going to come back to the same idea, which is, is it important to you? Hmm. Does it add value? Is it special? How can we make it more special? How can we be creative with, with this opportunity? Um, like this, this area of, of a traditional wedding moment how can we make it customizable to us and make it feel and reflect who we are as people that's what each piece is going to come down to and it does sometimes I, I do have you know people who push back sometimes where they're like oh it's just too much like it's just like it is what it is just walk down we don't need to like go through like every moment doesn't have to have a meaning but it does because this is such a, a, a an emotional day it's such a, a a day filled with love and filled with this hyper emotion that you want to take some time and pause to really go through each thing and, and ask yourselves, do we care? Do we care about this or do we not? Mm -hmm. And if we do care about this, then how can we make it reflective of who we are? Yeah. That's what's going to be, that's, what's going to help you in the decision process. Yes. Oh, and, uh, last for walking down the aisle, go together, come in together, leave together, right? Come in together, leave together. Yes. I I've seen a lot of people do that too. And I think that that's super cool. Cause I'm like, yeah, you're basically entering into this union together. Why not enter in it together? <laughs> yeah. And then the other factors would be wedding party entering. Do they come in paired up? Do they come in like one by one? Do you know, does like one side come in from, come in first and then the other side comes in and all to say the world is your oyster. Okay. You yeah. can have your wedding party enter however you choose to, however you would like. There are so many possibilities here that would almost be impossible to list them off. Um, but let's say if one partner is coming in from the side with their wedding party, uh, wedding party, like that's that's one way of doing it. And then the other partner's wedding party comes down the aisle. That's all. All of them are under the realm of possibility. Or they come in coupled and they, they just split apart. I can't think of any other options. They could walk in backwards. They could cartwheel. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's even. We've had people who. Um, like have their wedding party seated with their guests because well you, you know especially if they have them in some compromising footwear that, that and they have a long ceremony <laughs> they're very conscious of their their wedding party and they're like just you can sit down for the whole time but um yeah we've seen people kind of do a plethora of it I think the most like formal way that we've seen a lot of people do it is that they do have like their wedding parties walk in together but we've been seeing queer non-queer people who are doing like mixed wedding parties. So not specific to whatever gender or even height. You know, I know a lot of people like line people up based off of height. I'm always like line the people up based off of importance. Who cares about what the photo looks like? Yeah. You want the people who are like the closest to you to be the closest to you. Um, and so we've seen people kind of take it into their own. So with that, you know, we, I think if you are having a coordinator, that's where that kind of comes into play, where where they can give you some suggestions mm -hmm. for for those options. But for yourself, if you're like, that's weird, 
to have like people linked arms or like being escorted down the aisle. Let's just have them walk side by side without linking arms. It, it, it doesn't have to be this whole thing. I think that that's great. <laughs> Yeah. Or also, uh, one last tip is to, uh, is to organize them based on how long you've known them. Yes. That's a really easy, like, okay. So that means a sibling is going to be right next to you and then mm -hmm. maybe a college roommate. And then maybe, so you can kind of remove more of the emotion from it when it's like, <laughs> It's fine. It's my face. <laughs> Just let it like. <laughs> I'm pushing sorry, her out of the way. You. <laughs> um, but it kind of removes the emotion from the situation when you go with something literal like that, because it's also kind of emotional to be like, ah, oh, you're short or oh, you're super tall. Yeah. You're in the back. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. You know? So just kind of removing that opportunity and really sticking with, okay, those who are literally have known you the longest versus those who you you've known for a short amount of time, but are no less important to you. We're just arranging it by age of relationship. Right. Okay. So the next touch point would probably be pronouncement and grand entrance. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, knowing how you want to be pronounced, because I think that there is this this rhetoric where it's like, oh, if it's two females, then they must be wanted, they must want to be pronounced as Mrs. and Mrs. And if that doesn't, I, if that doesn't resonate with you, like, be upfront. Just say, hey, actually, I would prefer if we we ha are pronounced as the newlyweds, mm. the couple. And again, this comes back to the vendor situation, right? If you're in an area where maybe you don't have a lot of that representation or you don't have people who are able to, who don't do this in their normal practice, that's where that, like that advocation comes in for, into play. So I think that, you know, being upfront with how you want to be pronounced, I think that there's a series of it. We've heard people say, you know, yeah, the newlyweds, the couple, the happy couple, the the their last names we've heard kind of everything under the sun i think that there are there is a lot of resources that you can kind of seek out that give you different language opportunities that you can use if you're kind of like i don't really resonate with mr mr mrs mrs mr and mrs any of that so i think that there's areas where you can or there's resources that you can kind of turn towards to give you some insight on what what ways to be pronounced, but I think it is important to, to be very clear so that it's not assumed. Cause that is unfortunately what happens in this industry, especially if there are people who are like, well, I've done this for 20 years, you know, I'm, I'm really good at my job. A lot of the times they don't even think that the assumption is incorrect. They just are like, this is the way we've always done it. And if that's not you and that doesn't resonate with you, then I would say, yeah, be very clear. <laughs> Yes. Be extremely clear or tap on your support system. Absolutely. And yeah. most of these questions, tap in. yeah, most of these questions will probably be handled before your big day. But if, if you have that sensation of concern, talk to your coordinator, talk to a member of the wedding party and say, Hey, please go remind the DJ. Hey, please remind the efficient, go do this on my behalf or let them know ahead of time. Hey, this is a concern. And probably you wouldn't make it that far with a vendor if it's a huge concern. Um, but that's, you know, your wedding party was selected because you absolutely adore them to pieces. Right. So that yeah. could be something that they could come in and help kind of negate some of that emotional labor for you as well. Um, then I think the, the next part coming up would be the parent dances. Cause obviously in the most traditional sense, right. Would be mother, son, yeah. father, daughter, yeah. So, you know, all of this, all of these different traditions, I always encourage couples. I'm like, literally write down all of them. Some of them are, you know, are, are very outdated. Um, but knowing at least behind the reasoning as to why, what traditions are out there and then making a list or, or circling. I always tell people, I'm like, well, we give out forms that basically have all the options of traditions. And I'm like, circle yes or no, swipe left, swipe right. If this is something <laughs> you want to do. Yeah. And then from there, we can kind of tailor it to, to kind of fit what it is that your relationship represents. So like, maybe you don't have a father to dance with, but you want to dance with like a really dope uncle then, you know, we can kind of go through those, those details, but you don't have to include it if you don't want to. And I think knowing what those traditions represent can help you make the decision if those are things that you actually want to include on your wedding day. Um, so when it comes to parent dances, again, this comes back to, to vendors, you know, being really clear with them about what it is you like if there are any, you know, sensitive areas or like if you don't have family participation, you know, informing them so that when it gets closer to the day, they're not asking you about your, 
parent dances if you don't have parents who will be in attendance. Uh, we always call them family dances or okay, yeah, um, community dances. Um, and that op- that gives opportunity for us to do, you know, different things within that. So we've seen people dance with their best person. We've seen people dance with each other. Like what, what, instead of instead of a parent dance for my wife and I to, to kind of build in that gap, we did a six minute tribute to Beyonce. Stop it. Yes. Did you really? <laughs> yes. We did a six minute choreograph instead of the first dance, because I told my wife, I was like, we literally look ridiculous. Cause when have we ever done a slow dance together? <laughs> it just looks horrible. And so we did, we did a, a six minute dance cut with our wedding party choreographed dance number with she did one with her wedding party I did one with mine then we did one together and it was like this like long six minute dance and that was what we did in place and nobody felt bad for us at all because they were like holy crap that was amazing (laughs) wait does it is this does this exist on film it does but the reason it hasn't gone anywhere is I realized that I'm not that good of a dancer as I had originally (laughs) thought (laughs) And um, the four shots I took right before that dance um, definitely <laughs> lended to some loose elbows and some very, very loose knees that were just doing a lot of flaring motions that I'm like, oh gosh, I really can't let this hit the, the internet. But it is out there. And the people who were there were the only people who know that it it was, it exists. Well, and, and I guess now you're followers, <laughs> but yeah, it was pretty embarrassing (laughs) but it was great it was it was it was good and it and it was just this opportunity where we're like okay well here are all the dances that are out there right we can have our first dance we can have a money dance we can have a parent dance we can have um generational dance here's all the traditions and we're like scrap it let's just do one Mm. large dance that gets everybody hyped and then we go right into our dance floor and that's what we did (laughs) yeah that's awesome that's gosh that makes me just love you and your wife even more (laughs) Uh, it's even funnier because we started it off where it looked like it was a slow dance and it was to the song when a man loves a woman and the faces on my wedding guests were like <laughs> oh no she doesn't realize what she's dancing to and then it like remixes into um who runs the world girls <laughs> by Beyonce Zabrina this different- is the best thing I've ever heard <laughs> oh my gosh my cheeks hurt that's amazing I love that you started it with that song and then you're like psych no absolutely not no no not at all (laughs) yeah just getting fun with it I mean we are we are humorous people in our core so that just made so much sense for us and I think our wedding guests expected nothing less from us Mm -hmm. you know because it was reflective and again it's going to constantly come back to this is it reflective of who you are in your relationship? Does it actually add value? Is it is it something that represents who you are? And if you can check all those boxes, then then I would say do it. And if it if it doesn't check all those boxes, then I would say you know ask a little bit more prying questions of what why it's important. Do we feel obligated to do a parent dance even though our parents are not affirming? They have not been included in this day. They have not done the labor to get to know my other half. And am I doing this just to appease them? because that happens that yeah. happens where you're like you know your parents like no but I'm gonna walk you down the aisle but, and but they but they don't acknowledge that your partner exists and that and that's a real reality that a lot of people experience and so coming back to that support system coming back to the people who can advocate for you let them have the hard conversations so that you can just say you know what we're not going to do it and I love you but I want people and I want moments on our day to be reflective of us and reflective of love and mm. and you can make those decisions yeah oh and you can skip the bouquet toss and guard toss nobody really is doing them anyways shabai we don't need it it's <laughs> it's weird i i i know we we've i think we've seen it right have you seen any like fun garter toss options like maybe maybe there's like one i've i've seen people get iced yeah during the garter toss it. removal yeah. um and I'm telling you, it was, uh, there was one event where literally the entire wedding party started jumping up and down and screaming. Ah, it just, it was like, I was so happy that I knew it was coming and I was already filming it. It was so good. It was so funny. Yeah. See, but, those ones are good, but most of them are kind of funky. Kind of cringe. They, like they give you a little bit of the ick, especially, I don't, I don't know where, when this started, but there's this new 
attachment to the garter toss where the person who is retrieving the garter now gives a two minute strip tease. No, no, no. And I do, I do not receive that. And we're, yeah, <laughs> I do not acknowledge. I am, I am afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. so yeah and, and, and then even with the bouquet toss I'm like flowers are expensive now like oh, they're not yeah. cheap nope. like bouquets are like easily 350 plus now so who wants to chuck that in the air no and <laughs> you know? oftentimes we can't even find the toss bouquet so we grab one of the wedding party members bouquets yeah. and they throw that yeah. one and it's like yeah yeah so I, if you do want to do those Absolutely. Find a way to make them uniquely yours. I think I've mentioned this in a video before, but I had a couple do an award ceremony for like best dressed, most improved, um, most improved was my favorite one. Um, and the irony of the person who won best dressed actually that day was wearing like a polo shirt, shorts and Birkenstocks. Cause it was an outdoor wedding at like a, a public park type thing. And so they, they knew it was going to be hot and that they were not best dressed. So it was awesome. So really just finding unique ways to celebrate your story. Cause this is not, this is a space that you just man, you are so masterful in how you, you meet people where they're at and see to their needs with intentionality and with grace. Um, so I, I cannot profess to be an expert in this area at all. So thank you so much for being willing to come here and do the emotional labor of sharing this information, because like, I know this has been a requested video, but this is not my space to share that information. So the fact that you are here and the fact that you took the time out of your day to do this and to, to help out all the viewers, gosh, you're just the absolute best. Oh, thanks. So I, I love coming on here I, and, and chatting with you. It's always such a, such a transformative time to like go through these like details with you, with your followers. I, I enjoy it a lot. And if I can like leave everyone with like one more moment is just to remember that your wedding is about your marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the times what happens is that we get hyper focus in planning the wedding that we forget about the marriage we forget about the relationship we forget about like the whole reason why we're doing this right which is which is to this union between two people who who love each other and um I think that it's important to come back to that and if that's at the forefront of a lot of your decision making I think that this process is will lend to be a little bit more enjoyable mm -hmm. if you can come back to these moments of love and come back to these moments about making it about the couple and not about everything else and it's easier said than done and I understand yes. that because a lot of the times you know you hear a lot of us wedding professionals just preaching off a mountain saying like oh forget wedding traditions forget family obligations but when you're in the heat of it a lot of the times it it, it, it comes down it boils down to those moments of like having to advocate for yourself and having to advocate for each other, like letting your partner do that for you, letting your best people do that for you, letting yourself do that for you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that I became a better communicator and I was able to grow my relationship with my family because I was able to advocate for myself through my wedding. And I was able to lay my boundaries, lay my foundational mm -hmm. things that I was like, I'm not, a, I, I'm not going to let you do this to me. I, if you're not going to come in full support of who I am in all my glory and all the things that make me really beautiful, and you're not going to celebrate that, then don't come. And that doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I don't want you in my life. It just means that I want one day that is fully surrounded by the people who, who genuinely want to be around me and my existence and my partner's existence. That's what I want. And that ability to advocate for myself, that ability to lay my own boundaries, that ability to, to be able to speak up for myself allowed us to build the relationship back up with these people who maybe weren't there in support of us on the day of. Mm. I, I, I talked about this on the podcast, but my dad was not somebody who was a large role in our wedding day. And in the last two and a half years, we were able to take that experience because I was able to lay the boundary for myself of what I was going to allow and what I wasn't going to allow. And now we have a thriving relationship where we're able to kind of work through this. And he's acknowledged that he has not been a part of my wedding. He is remorseful for not being a part of it, but I am so much more happy that he's in my life as every day after our wedding. And it was because I was able to, to lean on the people who loved me 
have that support system. I had a partner who supported me through it all and I supported and advocated for myself. So that's that's what I would say is, is coming back to those moments, coming back to the moments of yourself, coming back to the moments of, of each other and coming back to the moments of your community if, if that is something that you have access to. So that's my spiel. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> and I, I think that you do, uh, if, if you find yourself in a, a position where you're not, you don't have that support system. Um, I think Zabrina, you do a beautiful job over at the gay agenda, really making a, a space for people to feel supported and, and feel seen and feel heard. So I guys, I, I cannot recommend this enough. Go over there, give her a follow. Um, you've been such a shining light in this community and I'm so grateful and honored to learn from you. Um, so thank you for your continued efforts at education for those of us who are in the process of figuring it out and for how much you advocate for, for your couples, uh, whether they are your actual clients or people who are just following you online to, to get some online support, you're doing a fantastic job and man, I'm just kind of honored to know you. Oh, thanks. Wow. I feel so, this is great. <laughs> I feel, oh, three is taking compliments. Oh no. Three is taking compliments. <laughs> just doing the weird word in the background. <laughs> Um, which was the exact move that I did in my oh. wedding dance. So, so we got a little snack, a, of that. A yeah, little sample. Little snack, little treat. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we have for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I know it was a long one. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, and Sabrina, thank you so much for jumping on this channel. I'll leave all of Sabrina's contact information down below if you want to reach out to her and her staff for continued support. And until next week, bye guys.